I V M. Mumbai, the city of dreams, a city that never really sleeps, or should I call it Bombay, or Bombay? What really is Mumbai? Is Mumbai sitting on Marine Drive, which we also call as the Queen's Necklace, looking at the glimmering lights as you look upon the sea? Is it the skyline of the Taj and the Gateway and the Oberoi? Or is Mumbai in the gullies, in the corners, in the nookards, in conversations, in between the pages of our next guest's new book? Joining me in this episode, we have Jane Borges, who is also a features editor at Midday. and is currently written a brilliant brilliant saga of kavel in her new book bombay balcha which we will discuss in a lot of detail about the spice the color the flavor and the kind of mumbai she takes us on a tour of so right after this short break be ready to know mumbai in a completely different light do you wish you were smarter well so do we But the next best thing we could make you sound smarter and to help you with this endeavor we are simplified Ooh. a podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a little knowledge a lot of poor jokes and a ton of random trivia episodes out every monday on the ivm podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts see ya the guest for today is my personal favorite because this is something that she said in one of her interviews that fiction can do what facts can't which is to evoke an emotional reaction which is something that i live by and also i have a personal bias because we share an alma mater so i am very sure that both of us have great experiences to share about where we studied and how that went about in the heart of the city and our personal experiences with literature and apart from that she's somebody who writes about mumbai in a way that i couldn't have imagined it to be So welcome Jane. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 so nice because you know um Mumbai books as a concept like writing about Mumbai is not something that's like brand new mm-hmm. but you see all of these Mumbai books and they're so different from one another because somebody would imagine oh it could become a genre in itself. Great but it's not technically the same city if you Look at it because a while ago I read Milk Teeth by Amrita Mahale. Before that I read Suketu Mehta's Maximum City, and you know you see all of these different shades. And Jerry Pinto writes a lot about Mumbai, and it's just so much fun. So, and you wrote such a beautiful book, which is like I like to think of it like a pickle, like you write about it. Thank you. And my immediate connection is drawn to Arundhati Roy, God of Small Things, how she talks about paradise preserves and pickles in the story and. She's looking at the idea of making a pickle and how history itself pickles a lot of these stories, which I think happens a lot with your book as well. Almost, which is why the title. Yeah. Yes. So I think you have a reverse story with the title, right? Yes. Yeah. The pickle comes right in the end. <laughs> and yeah. And uh, I think till till the end, you really don't know why I've called the book Bal Chao. Okay. But it's a mix of um, people. you know okay. different kinds of emotions that you're experiencing and it's all marinating you know over the you know of the course of 60 70 years and yeah. you finally see it all come together in the end perfectly which is why i thought bombay balcha would be perfect perfect initially you know when when we named we called this balcha a lot of people thought we were writing a book about food, food yeah. but it is not really you know not everything you know not every title about food is about food it is just used okay. as um you know it's used to symbolize something and okay. here it is a lot of things you know because pickle is like that right yeah. sweet <laughs> and spicy and tangy so all of that yeah and i think book. pickle is best like i like how the story marinates the pickle throughout and it's in the <laughs> end because that's the process of making right. a pickle in itself yes. that you have to wait that longing that waiting exactly which brings the flavor to it yes and i've heard that so writing is not something that's new to you like this is not obviously your first book no. you have also done a non fiction with husain zaidi where you spoke about the mafia queens mm-hmm. coming from there to a very domestic space of a pickle is a very big journey but it i is. want to i want to roughly talk about mafia queens like in short how's your experience writing that 
so you know the reason why i was on board for mafia queens also was because hussein wanted to tell the story very differently he okay. wanted to it was just not collecting facts and putting it together like a report correct and i think he identified that uh, style that i had quite early on okay. it's something that even i did not recognize at that point that i was a better storyteller mm. and that's why he got me on board and then he trained me to become a crime reporter when i wasn't i was a sub editor at the asian age where he okay. used to work and he was my boss there okay so that's how i got on board and it became interesting the whole process of reporting and researching about the mafia yeah. but ultimately for me the whole f- the, the fun part was about writing and putting the story together yeah and i always wanted you know i always knew i wanted to be a storyteller mm-hmm. and um, the idea was to tell stories about people okay. so even after the book became a success i knew i did not want to you know the, the problem when you write about crime is that you get pigeon holed as a crime writer yeah and for a long time it took me a long time to break out of it That's because every time i approached publishers or publishers approached me they thought i could do a second book about crime, crime and i yeah. should be doing something on crime as opposed to um fiction because mm-hmm. crime sells and yeah. honestly it does you know you'll have a lot of takers for crime and which is why mafia queens worked um so well when i wrote yeah. it it was my first book though we had an established writer like hussein zaidi yeah. it worked because it was crime and it was a novel idea correct so yes i struggled with that bit where I had to convince people that you know maybe I'm not meant for that and <laughs> I think I would do literary writing better. better yeah. So you never see this transition right someone who's who's done non-fiction <laughs> suddenly move into literary writing. Yeah. So I think that took a bit of time for people to accept and okay. for me also to acknowledge that I could do something different. Yeah. And when I was even prepared and when uh my literary agent saw my work and said it's a good piece of writing i couldn't really you know i i i was a little surprised that he even thought that it was that good enough for it to be sent to publishers okay. so i think that is the struggle when you when you are typecast as yeah. a certain kind of writer and you want to break out of that mold and want to really show what you are about yeah and and you know i was a little hesitant because like you said you know there is this whole broad you know mumbai is a huge cast correct you know cast yeah. of people and here i have selected like this one little insignificant community that really nobody thinks about and even in bombay today in, yeah. in a city like mumbai it it has almost vanished and disappeared correct so why do we talk about it it's not only because it's i'm talking about a minority it's about a village that no longer exists mm. so yeah. is it an idea that would appeal to someone say down south or up north how can you make it universal Correct. so that was something that we had to think about and i had to think about while writing the stories fortunately um, after the book came out i realized that someone in delhi could um, relate, as- to and relate to someone sitting in um, kavel yeah a, a place that even mumbai kids don't know don't about know. because um, when i started reading the book i realized like we have this image of sobo Right. Yes. So when you talk about the South Bombay, you're like, oh my God, South Bombay people, and you have like typical accents that come up. But I feel the kind of South Bombay that I have seen as a child, like the kind of South Bombay my father took me around to see, was these small little places, these pockets in the city, which actually make South Mumbai what it is. Because it's not only your Flora Fountain or your Nariman Point or, or your Marine Drive or your Kulaba Causeway. Hmm, hmm. Go to Dhobi Talao. Look at look at what's around you. Look at what's happening because it's still, I think, uh, you know, people take heritage tours across, right? right? Just like in Bandra, you have your Ranwar Village that's hmm, now hmm. building up, and people are actually going to see these villages. But it's not just something that you know you. fossilized in history like a village that you see with ancient architecture but i mean people are still living that lifestyle i mean, I mean your research not so, so much yeah, in okay. south Bum- south mumbai you know that is one of the primary reasons why i um, decided that i wanted to write this novel because um, i moved to mumbai in 2003 okay before that i lived in muskat you know man and uh, when i moved here this place was very different from what it is now you know okay at least then there was some semblance of community life in a place like kavel correct and it's a it's a christian neighborhood, neighborhood. it's just one lane it's okay. sandwiched between chira bazaar and kalva devi road yeah and um, 
there was some it, it was a different place for me because i come from um, a city in muskat where my neighbors were pakistanis bangladeshi sri lankans filipinos and suddenly here i'm surrounded by catholics everywhere yeah. and for me that was a little discomforting because um you are not used to living with yeah. catholics you know you're not l- used to living the idea of um um god every day mm-hmm. you know that yeah. was that was reserved for a weekly um Ma, visit like a, yeah. to the church yeah. not you know in your everyday life where everything is uh, you know everything is related to something with god yeah so you know you you would have a rosary session you would have <laughs> nice. a choir singing session so everything it took a little bit of time for us to also kind of uh, adjust to that yeah and within a span of few years you know the elderly in the the community was suddenly you know dying or passing away yeah. families were moving yeah. and um, i realized that by 2015 we are in my neighborhood itself you know 10 to 12 people have already either passed away or have moved out oh, okay. so and and we are a very small um, i'm talking about my neighborhood which okay. has two buildings okay and we were already around 25 people okay and if you drop it by half, half that means yeah. there is 10 or 12 or 13 now yeah and what happened to the rest um and that worried me because maybe 10 years from now we might just not be there yeah. and um you know while writing and researching for mafia queens of mumbai i came across kavel in several books okay and um, from there i realized that kavel had a very interesting history in uh, mumbai's um in you know in the larger scape of okay. mumbai because um, three mayors, mayors or from yeah. the from the city actually lived in kavel and in my building oh, okay and um, dr vegas um i don't know if you've heard of dr gabriel vegas he okay. he was the one who saved the city during the bubonic plague of 1896 97 oh, okay and the street that i live in is named after him okay history books say that he lived in dhobitala which is not very far from here but i have a feeling that he did have a connection with kavel his family lived here or something of that sort which is why the street was named, named after, after him, him. Yeah. and um, since avia school which is in dhobi tala yeah. used to be in kavel you know before okay. it became this huge thing and before the yeah. jesuits thought that you know the, the the school became so popular that they had to move out into a larger space and that's how st xavier's high school started and it okay. was uh, it is a very significant institution oh, it in completed 150 years yes right? last yes. year so um yes a lot of history is intertwined and um, Uh, this place has played a very important role in the larger scheme of things in, in the Mumbai. city yeah. and why are we forgetting it and that was my problem that, that that was my fear actually that you know people didn't know people in kavel don't know about kavel's history okay yeah. um you know if you ask any resident uh, what is uh, you know do you know about these things and or probably just have a conversation with them about kavel they they not find anything interesting uh to talk about i think yeah. i come from a place of being an outsider because i moved here in 2003 yeah while they've lived here forever you know they you know their parents and then their grandparents have lived here for yeah. um, over 4 5 generations so when you're an insider you can't see it with the same lens yeah. as that of an outsider sometimes and it makes me feel like a little scared that do we normalize history so much i think i think kavelites have normalized their own history so yeah. much that um they were almost the, neutralized it, yes you know? and yeah. um that was my fear and you know because i was slowly be- becoming i was getting sucked into this this life yeah. and this community i thought there was something that i could do to tell its story, story and yeah. and i i started writing this book actually after i became nostalgic about kavel i left um okay. after mafia queens of mumbai and after i completed my masters from snd yeah. i moved briefly to muskat again because my father worked there okay So I was working there with a newspaper, and I just moved there for a while because I wanted to break from Mumbai. Mumbai and that's when I realized how much I missed Kavel. Mm-hmm. I was weird because till then I really didn't think too much of, of it. Yeah. And these stories started that way, you know, started out of reminiscing this beautiful place that I have left behind. And as soon as I came back, I forgot about the book <laughs> because you know I was there again, and there's no need to tell a story yeah. anymore. Is it? But it's almost diasporic that way, right? It is, you yeah. know, <laughs> but uh, in a, in a, in a different Very way. Yeah. Like I mean, we are subverting the diaspora. Yeah, we are here. subverting <laughs> diaspora here because uh, <laughs> yeah, but it is in a way. Yeah. 
it's it's more like an Arthurian legend to me right now. I mean, you did a proper homecoming. Yes, and that's why you wrote yes. it. Yes, yeah. But I mean, I find it really amazing how um, since you work for a weekly and you write about a lot of things, you edit, you write features, and you are so engrossed in the story of Mumbai that it scarily and deceptively becomes a very single narrative. Like we mm-hmm. all look at Mumbai as one Mumbai, but not one region is similar to the other. Not right. Every hundred meters is similar to the other, for that matter, and. just to you know go from that macro perspective at the city to like a small 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 smaller space which is like a building where people are living and like there are all of these funky characters in every chapter it's a short story in itself mm-hmm. and it all ties together i think it's very symbolic of mumbai to be very honest right and uh, to be very honest you know when um, with a paper like midday yeah. especially sunday midday where i work yeah. they give you a lot of freedom um with um you know looking at your city in a certain kind of okay. lens you know so yeah. i think um this book has been painted with those experiences of me as a journalist Correct. or uh, by those experiences as me as a journalist because um i think whatever i reported about or wrote about you know somewhere just um seeped into my narrative mm. yeah. and um, it gave me perspective this Correct. book earlier was something um uh, was more it came from a place of nostalgia okay after i worked started working with midday it came from a perspective of history hmm. you know and suddenly it took a it it became a, um um it had a larger you know it 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 fit well into the scheme of the city you know when Correct. you're talking about the yeah. city's history which is why you see that um, a lot of stories are in a way connected with yeah. the larger larger history, larger history yeah. of the city so it's not only a history of kavel because you can't ignore the history of the, the city, city while, yeah. when you are writing about a place which is within the city yeah you know so um i think that helped you know working in a newspaper it gave me some sense of perspective i uh, there's a good interesting example in the book okay i don't know if you've read this chapter called the wedding at kavel I don't think I've gotten there. Yet. So yeah, yeah so there, this chapter is about a bell that is, you know, single-handedly yeah. responsible mm. for destroying an entire wedding. Wedding. Yeah. Okay, and I'll not get into the details, mm. but it's a bell that chimes at the wedding because in you know in, in Christian weddings, when when there's a wedding, traditionally the bell rings, okay. the bell at the church, and um, I wrote this chapter somewhere in Jan two thousand and sixteen. Okay, and I joined midday in March two thousand sixteen. Okay. Some uh, somewhere in October, I came across this book by this priest from Wasai, okay. who was re- researching about the missing bells from uh, the forts in Sindhudurg, Wasai, oh. and all of you know all these okay. the the forts there. So you have Wasai Fort, and yeah. Um, so what happens is that um, in the in his in the course of his research, we we learn that when the Marathas had fought their war. with uh, the portuguese in the, in 17 um in the 1730s okay um back then when you you know you wanted to destroy um the portuguese the first thing okay. you did was destroy their church oh, so because okay. that was their center, center of power yeah. you know the portuguese built their entire universe around the around church, the church yeah. so if you destroy the church means you took hold of that village okay. so they started um wasai at that point was the capital of the portuguese because Correct. they had already given away the island of bombay to the british british yeah and the salsat islands uh, was still part of the portuguese under the portuguese Correct. rule and so while on their way to wasai they destroyed several churches oh. and um, the bells weren't destroyed so the bells were left okay and by the time they came to wasai and you know they took over wasai in a matter of few days and wasai also had um you know it it had several churches within that yeah. the wasai fort if you know of yeah correct um after they won the war those mis- the the bells were then given away as um a you know a token of victory to okay. the chief of every you know army With, unit okay and the chief then took it back to his village and he placed it in his temple or either built a shrine around it oh okay there was one bell that eventually found its way into a church which is not very far from kavel in another christian neighborhood called dabul okay. which is just around 500 to 600 uh, meters, meters from yeah. from kavel and uh, that bell still 
is in the bowl and still it used to ring for the longest time i don't know if it does anymore wow. and uh, the rest of them are now located in different parts of maharashtra because um, the marathas did take it back with them okay. some of them are lying in godown some of them are um, still ringing wow. so it's weird it's it's 300 years and we still have those bells, bells with us yeah. and i thought it was such an interesting piece of history yeah. about the city about the state about uh, uh, just the idea yeah. of politics itself i yes, mean it's such a political move to take the bells out and yeah it it was a political back, move yeah. but i think the way the the marathas also um you know venerated the bells yeah you know and um, they kept a part or you know some semblance of history with them with them yeah um makes it a very interesting story that i thought could be you know easily weaved into my narrative and that's what i did so mm. you get that bit of story yeah. about a bell and then you also get you know the story about right. kavel as well as um the history so, of you know the marathas also so i thought it was very interesting and that's how you know that's how stories feed into each other yeah so the more i hear about the book i realize it's a pickle personified <laughs> right right and there is no way anyone can deny that you're not a storyteller because mm. for the last 5 minutes i've been just sitting here and listening to you tell me the story of like whatever has been happening i can actually visualize it mm. but you had a journey writing these yourself so i think we can take a quick short break and come back to talk more about how do you actually write these stories then okay sure Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd like to thank our sponsors for the week, Storytel and Intel. Sponsors make this stuff possible. Please shout out to them. Let them know that you appreciate them paying us money. Also wanted to remind you all that we have an audience survey going. The audience survey is only going to be up for another couple of weeks, and I'm frankly disappointed even though three times the number of you people are listening to us as the last audio survey, only half of you have filled it out. So, yeah, I mean like come on, please get to it. ivmpodcast.com/survey. We want your opinion to matter when we decide what we're going to do in the future, and I'm sure you want yours to matter too. So, please do fill out the survey. A quick note, one of our favorite shows, States of Anarchy, hosted by the awesome Hamsini Hariran. This show is going to move to a fortnightly schedule starting 21st January 2020. Keep listening to it. It's a great show on global affairs, foreign policy and more. On Sarah says this week, Sarah talks to YouTuber, actor and comedian Sahil Kathar. Sahil talks about the discoverability of artists through YouTube, playing Syed Kirmani in the upcoming film 83 and watching Cyrus on TV while growing up. On Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav talks about Vincent van Gogh and how the color blue is extremely significant to the people of Uzbekistan. On paperback, Rachita and Satyajit talk with the duo Aditi Gua and Sandeep Ramesh about their love for storytelling and their different evolved tastes for books like Eat, Pray, Love on one hand and Sapiens on the other. On Lit Nama, Lakshmi is joined by author Jane Borges who talks about her novel Bombay Balchao and stories of Mumbai as they weave through her life. The Simplified Gang is back with the last part to their 2019 recap. Join Chuck Narayan and Tony as they talk about Amazon, Brexit and Gully Boy. On Gabi City, Sunetra and Farah talk about their identities within the queer community of their respective cities and how it has evolved as they move from one city to another. On IVM Likes, Abbas, Ritika, Alika, and Antarish talk about their pop culture resolutions for this year in 2020. On Water Player, Mikhail went for the India-Australia match at Vankhede Stadium on Tuesday. Have a listen to Siddharth and Mikhail talking about the experience. On Pulia Bazi, Pranay and Saurabh discuss the future of electric vehicles in India with Rahul Raj, co-founder of Inverted, an energy storage company. On our Kannada podcast Thale Harate Sudha Narayan and Dr Lohit HD join Ganesh Chakravarti to talk about the many lakh canine residents of Bangalore. And with that let's get you back to your show. So like we established before uh, you had written Mafia Queens which was a very fact driven book and then you moved to Bombay Balcha which was fiction which is weaved in with history time space and everything is just at a crossroads in your book right. for a large extent. So when you're writing like historic narratives or when you're blending history with culture with society and something as simple as a domestic space in people's lives how do you do that transition like people think that moving from fact to fiction is easier because you get this free realm where you can you know create your own stories or like create an alternate reality but is it devoid of facts or do facts kind of help create fiction how did you navigate this process So you know I was very clear that I wanted to talk about a place like Kavel the okay. place that I live in okay. and which is why I you know kept the name of the village 
as okay. is you know initially yeah. i thought oh i'll give you another kind of name which sounds like kavel but then i said no because mm. there is the only way to generate interest about a community like kavel okay. is to talk about it in maybe in fiction form because Correct. that is something i said earlier that you know sometimes you have the histories it's not like nobody knows about kavel if you go yeah. to asiatic library and you look for kavel you will find its history okay. you will learn about it but how many of you would go and do that you know yeah. that it doesn't tend to evoke a reaction or emotion the way storytelling does yeah which is why we believe in fairy tales you know because they make you feel good about something yeah and um, that is why i decided that i wanted to tell this in fiction format at the same time i wanted to tell a story about a community that was vanishing mm. now when you're talking about when you when you're talking about a real community there is only this much that you can tamper with right Correct. with the with history because you are at the end of the day telling a story which is about a very real place something that you can go back and fact check right, right. i can go yes. and look for the city yeah. you know uh, that was the idea i wanted the there, there to be a certain kind of curiosity mm. about this place so that people in mumbai especially who don't don't live very far from kavel can come can here yeah. and can look for this place and can look for those very places you know those uh, little buildings or those little hole in the wall places that i talk about yeah. and feel who oh, you know you know yeah, i i read about it yeah. you know i i know this is exactly what i was thinking about oh well it doesn't look like what i read about Correct. you know so that was the idea i wanted to generate a sense of curiosity now when you're talking about how much i can do you know there is there is also it it, it is it is like working with mafia queens you know mm -hmm. yeah. at the end of the day we were working with a collection of facts and okay. you had to tell it only in you you were there was a certain kind of restriction Correct. now with with fiction that the you know the 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 um the walls open a little you okay. know and and that means you you have a little more space and creative freedom okay. to talk about these same facts but differently so you know yeah. people for instance Correct. i wanted to capture the the language the style mm -hmm. their stories for what they were but tell it through the eyes of somebody else, else which is yeah. why i created different people but, but most of your characters are inspired by real life people you yeah, met yes yeah. so i some all of them probably are inspired from people their stories are inspired from real life Correct. events because at the end of it i wanted to keep it as authentic as possible yeah even the history for instance we talk about a fireman here yeah. in this book and um, we in kavel did have a fireman who lost his life in the um, dockyard explosion It's of really. 1944 yeah now how many of the millennial kids know about the dockyard mm. explosion Or it was one of the dockyard as like this place where um you know there's an exhibition happening or but the city burned it? the yeah. city burned back then in april 1944 and for several days and people didn't know what happened Correct. you know it it was not like news was being relayed to you in real time mm. you know families who lost their their loved ones in the blast didn't know about what had happened until a month or two ago mm. some of their bodies were never, never even found the same thing with the real person from my neighborhood arnold dave's okay. whose body was never really found so people never knew what was so that family never got a sense of closure, closure yeah. you know and i thought it was such an so, and and you know if you ask the elderly residents of kavel they still talk about it as being one of the saddest days in kavel mm -hmm. i can only imagine a neighborhood where someone has died and nobody knows what has happened to him mm -hmm. and um, it stays with you for a very long yeah. time so i thought i needed to talk about it but yeah. not talk about it from the real arnold dave's character because nobody knows him yeah. anymore as a the 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 residents who lived with him and and they are not here to tell his story mm. so i didn't want to do that and the problem with telling real stories is there's always someone to counter that narrative and say you know i know the story differently and you have you know imagined it differently which is why i didn't want to get there yeah. you know i didn't want that confrontation because my idea was to tell the story of a community so yeah. let me create different characters who live very similar lives maybe or okay. who you know who who talk similarly who have the same ideas about um people neighbors about the church about god about um, non catholics mm. you know or about mangalorians or east indians yeah. and and bring those people together and create a different story so it's a parallel kavel you know <laughs> yeah. it located in the same place but having similar lives and experiences that that's so just, you know at the yeah. end of the day when you read the book you do get a sense of the history of kavel and yet okay. not 
Yeah. So I I leave it to you to find out what you need to find. Yeah, I mean there's this one thing we constantly learn in like our literature classes as well, right? There's no one history and right. there are like multiple histories coexist. It's it's such a nice thing to see actually multiple histories woven together because you lie at the center like at the organizing center of the book somehow where yeah. you're looking at things that have happened in the past as an outsider as an insider and then weave it with people who probably because i my mother comes from a locality which is majorly dominated by catholics and right. they've lived like um basically in that gauten for years and gautens as a concept were initially um not re- really visited so far so right. it, even if it's lying in your elite suburbs people never really you know gave them a thought like so, kotachi wadi exactly yes. so you do generalize like when you're looking at the skyscraper li- like landscape of mumbai you just generalize these places and paint them as one right. but the amount of cultural diversity they used to have because this one lane used to have all of these gujaratis who also had the catholic accent while they used to speak marathi right. because uh, some words are very very uh, home to that space because yes. you wouldn't really uh, hear them outside somewhere and as a child it was such a amazing thing to discover because True. if you come from a place that speaks like brahminical marathi or like your traditional hindi that mm-hmm. mumbai car speak and then you come to this place which has a very alternate language idea of a language in itself and that somehow i feel when you're picking all of these characters on these different points in history it kind of seeps into your book because it it for me it makes like this multiple stories of history like yeah, you're looking yeah. at some real life occurrences and you can see those traces like that also happens when you read sacred games right so even when you're looking like at the life of a ganesh gaitonde mm-hmm. his life is not explained in like the his world does not mean his own personal world he is also impacted by everything else that's happening around because even if you see the actual series you see they take this narrative shift between telling you what's happening in the historical setting and then bring it back right so i mean that brings me to another point that i wanted to make that how stories that are written about places mm-hmm. are majorly always told through history mm. but i like when you say that you tell them through people because then you have these windows or not really a window more like a ledge where you can stand and say like okay, this is also correct this is also correct but this is where i see it from and right this is how far my horizon stretches where right. i can see the story ends probably yours begins from there yeah and you know it's also a story about confrontation at the end of the day you know correct. we um, like in bombay you see bombay mumbai yeah. um <laughs> in 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 a city like ours you see catholics as being just one of a kind yeah but uh, when you read this book you'll realize that within the catholic community also you have so many diverse groups and they yeah. don't get along well it's correct. it's not like they they are best <laughs> friends and only the catholics know that they don't yeah. get along well with each other or so you got to go to convent school and learn it the learn, hard way yeah. yeah and and um i wanted to talk about this you know and and talk it from talk about it from a lens of a, you know from from a person because you know if if you ask the catholic community in general they say oh all is well we are yeah. all together we go to the same church we attend the same mass and yeah. we we are you know we are best friends but it's only people within the community who will tell you hey you know i have a problem with the goans who came in mm. because i'm an east indian i'm the original i'm the native of this land yeah. and they took over and um, you know they took over our jobs they took over our land and you know now and they have bigger homes and they are richer and they're more educated and we are languishing so that's that that kind of confrontation is always there and yeah. so with the mangalorians go and mangalorians go back a long way yeah. they go back you know when the inquisition took place and then the mangalorians come to bombay and the goans never like them anyway yeah. so so you know there is this whole even in till until several dec- like few decades ago people wouldn't l- want their kids to get intermarry within these communities yeah. mm-hmm. even now there is a little resistance towards it are you okay. marrying a goan you're marrying a mangalorian are you, you sure you come from a mixed parentage yourself right i do i do so my my family is a mix of we don't have east indians but we have mix of goans and okay, you know mangalorians yeah. and uh, so so i have seen this within my household yeah. itself you know my mom telling me that maybe her mother in law was not the happiest when you know she, her her son she was mother in law was goan okay and she herself married someone who was from karwar very okay. close to karnataka but mm-hmm. she was not happy when um the daughter in law was mangalorean she'd have preferred uh, it was not that she didn't treat her well yeah. but she would have preferred a goan maybe yeah. 
and um, so you see that happening and you know in conversations within our house my mum would always my mum and dad would always take a dig at each other's communities you know okay. you manglorians are like that <laughs> and you goans are like that and i'd always find it very curious like i i was always very curious about why is it so Correct. you know why are communities like we know the larger history of hindu muslims and you know the other minorities yeah. but do we know about these communities like if i've asked my mummy why do you think you know you have a problem with goan she doesn't know she doesn't have an oh, answer yeah so i went back to try and find the answers to it and that's where i came to know how you know the manglorians were originally from goa but during the inquisition when the portuguese were converting these manglorians moved you know southwards because they didn't want to follow the goan way of the portuguese way of life life yeah and so they were still converted but they were more conservative which is why they live a lot like hindus even their weddings you'll see them yeah. wear the sarees and the garlands right. and they they still um you know their their kids still have hindu names yeah i think you you have a bit in your book about yeah, this right? so where the manglorians dress up very differently, differently from the goans goans and they say that they have come to a funeral, funeral. Yeah. so so those ideas still exist yeah. still exist where people f- still feel them the manglorians are more traditional mm. the goans still feel that they owe allegiance to you know port- the portuguese okay. which is why all of them go rushing to get a portuguese passport even today <laughs> wow so yeah so that is how it works it's, so i also another interview of yours i read that uh, you used to tell stories like since you were 12 yeah um, i i loved imagining stories yeah, so I'm, my mom had to try and figure out whether i was telling the truth, truth. or i was not <laughs> But, i would always make up things i mean that's also beautiful in a very weird sense because then you can distance also yourself from the truth a little yeah, you feel like you story gives you like the liberty to be like i'm going to make my alternate version of yes and i believed in my stories you know yeah. if if i lost a pencil and i came home and i would tell my mom a completely different story about how someone <laughs> you know stole it from me though i know i lost it and i was very confident about the story yeah. to the point that i forgot what the original story, story was. was about oh my god so yeah. you know and and i think the the whole idea of storytelling came from that yeah. imagining this this better life for myself in yeah. a different way do you know to avoid a situation by creating another parallel one yeah. which is better than the other yeah, the, yeah i mean i know you also like adichie a lot i love her yeah so i mean it it very very like strongly reminds me of her talk her tet talk danger yeah. of a single story oh yeah oh, i love those about, lines I, yeah it's i think i have it by heart like <laughs> yeah, things of it like i know like stories my dispossess and my line but the point is how she also talks about how a single story harms yes as well as it helps so it right. kind of saves you as well as puts you in this very weird place i think that's what your story also does because um like you said like minorities were clubbed together in a very weird sense it's only when you jump into these pockets and pick up storytelling as a tool and you know pick up characters who can actually voice their dissent voice their history and i think the fact that they're saying it becomes a resistance in itself right? right and that's when you can actually say like when you say hindu muslims and uh, like other religions or christians and other minorities it's not one homogeneous right. group right and i think mainstream literature or mainstream narratives can never encompass all of this true true you need to like jump into years of living that life and then coming from there and true actually saying it out loud right has your experience also been very similar you know um I don't know how best to answer this question but um, I was very very conf- you know when I I knew one thing when I was telling the story you know and that is one of the reasons why you see me telling it from different voices, voices yeah. and from different perspectives and from different styles is because I did not want it to look like one person story, story. Mm-hmm. you know so you don't have a clear protagonist in this in this book yeah. you have a recurring character called Michael Cutino yeah. but his story only is you, you get a larger sense of his story only one or two chapters really maybe yeah. the story about uh, um his wife mm-hmm. you know and and him you know fighting over a chiku tree yeah. or maybe the story of him and his little sweetheart um, childhood sweetheart or the letters letters yeah. but there are 12 chapters in this book and the the remaining eight chapters are about other people correct and michael just becomes this little this person who keeps coming you know keeps stitching these two coming me, up he and, becomes like a guide yeah. you know somehow he's like, like a, he's like a sutradhar like you have yeah. in you know in your <laughs> hindi uh, so he 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 helps you know weave the stories together yeah. stitch he's like like this person who helps stitch it all together, together he's like the yeah. tailor yeah 
um but he's not a protagonist Correct. and and the idea was to tell the story through different people you know and and that was very important for me and i have taken this whole chimamanda adichie's lines about the danger of a telling single, of yeah. a single story very seriously i've always believed and and i think i remember reading that first before writing this book yeah. you know that you need to tell it from different perspectives, perspectives yeah that's what she says about stereotypes right mm-hmm. she says stereotypes it's not that they are 100% dangerous but it's dangerous that you have only one stereotype right because even if you've seen the catholic representation in media mm-hmm. or like films back in the day you used to have this very typical goa and always happy almost always drunk dude yeah yeah you used to represent See, all of goa and and you have to explain why they became what they did and which is yeah. the idea of this book you know one review spoke about um, recently there was a review that came out in the voice of fashion which is a very okay. w- well written review by trisha gupta if i'm not mistaken she spoke about the dressing um mm. that you know the dresses worn by the goans in the book yeah. and you know and and you you realize that they wear the same dresses that um we talk about in in our in in our bollywood films yeah it's just that the kind of women that you show there and the kind of lives they live are so different, different. from the lives that the yeah. women live in this book they're Correct. still very they're very conservative more conservative than any other person mm. living in you know in in a city would be yeah. but there is a problem with how we a uh, represent stereotypes. So mm. I remember my editor when she read the book she said you know do you feel that you you are pandering to these little stereotypes mm. about you know the drunk go and or maybe you know um um that over zealous uh, or you character, know character yeah. or this little flirtatious girl. Yeah. I said probably they do exist and they exist in every community. Yeah. You know you you will have a drunk Hindu you'll have a, <laughs> a, a, you 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 probably have a flirtatious uh, a woman from another community yeah. and it it's, it it happens everywhere these are people and um you know people these are, are and people really are ste- th- there are stereotypes when yeah. you 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 have drunk stereotypes i'm Correct. talking about where these feelings and emotions you need to understand where these feelings and emotions come, come from, from yeah. why uh, say a character like benjamin decided to choose the bottle over a better mm-hmm. life for himself there was yeah. a reason and i try and explain that over a, over you know a series of chapters yeah. and again another review said you know you can't really love or hate anyone you feel upset and angry with one character in one <laughs> chapter yeah. and then you really feel sorry for them by the next by the by maybe the next or the you know a few chapters later and that was the idea to not make you feel in love or feel extreme yeah. reactions of hate or anger towards any anyone, character yeah. you know let them just be let let us see how they evolve because people are like that you know yeah. you cannot love and hate someone throughout your life you can't love michael <laughs> forever he's such a sweet person in the yeah. beginning and somewhere you see that he's he's as <laughs> stupid and idiot yeah. you know foolish you as know somewhere you know yeah. yeah so that is how it is with people i also remember this half post review um mm-hmm. where they spoke about food majorly and right. this is something i also noticed while i was reading because i love books that talk about food to be very honest because I feel like if you really want to capture the essence of human life and how do these characters really feel that food becomes a very important marker right to what's happening because um if I'm not mistaken Anita Nair has this book uh, 100 shades of white yes and where she talks about the pickles again mm. because just keep coming back to the conversation that's great where she talks about Amu who makes pickles and right. when her life is about to go a little haywire the pickles start going bad mm they become yes. a symbol of up like uh, something like that, like a foreshadowing of sorts yes. where they use food to like food brings prosperity but at the same time when food goes bad her life gets a little right. worse over time so you also have a lot of food images while you're reading and if you're someone who's aware of goan cuisine or mm. who knows how goan food in general works then you'll really find these resonances right. to different cultures and i think have post really covered that well how they spoke yes. about food so was there like a proper intention why food so my grandmother is going and you know her life okay. revolves around food, food so she's yeah. never really worked outside you okay. know her life has been in the kitchen and okay. looking after her family and she wakes up in the morning saying what should i cook for lunch and you know her evening is spent thinking about what should i cook for dinner yeah. and that's how her life has always been she's 87 and she only talks about food you know and when she comes to our house to she the and she spends some time with us we see her wake up and she enters the kitchen the first thing and says she asks my mom what are you making today mm. so you know her life revolves around food food is such an important element of uh, for her to um you know nourishing 
yeah the, the the children nourishing the family with food yeah. it makes her happy, happy. Um, it does make my mother also very happy and you know my mom has an idea about how you you know when when it comes to celebrations food becomes such an important yeah. element for her she refuses even till date to order food from outside because she feels wow. that if you if even if you're cooking for 25 people i'll cook yeah. you know because i want to cook <laughs> and that is that is how i i my idea of celebration is and i think for the catholic community which you know is is um it's not a lie that we love to celebrate okay. you know we we believe in celebrations we take our celebrations very seriously and apart from alcohol food is also very important to <laughs> yeah. us you know so if you go to any go in or mangalorean or east indian home it is a very important um you know element Correct. of yeah. it's you know they they spend and invest a lot of time into cooking not so much now hmm. but back then yes Yeah. So I thought why not you know you know I I have seen this growing up and you know I've looked at menu cards from say 40 50 years ago What? and That's and so that cool. I did that I did for the as part of the research, the research you know yeah. I asked my mom what you know they had for their wedding and from that yeah. I kind of you know got a sense of what kind of foods were you know uh, eaten during celebrations or during feasting and uh, Uh, why food was cooked in a certain way yeah. you know even the mon- the pickles that i speak about the balchow i just wrote about it assuming that you know it's a you know it 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 fit well into my narrative it was only later like i said again stories feed mm. other stories yeah. i was doing a story for midday on monsoon pickles yeah. and that's where someone told me that you know back then you did not have um, refrigerators Refrigerator. to store yeah. your fish and in houses like catholic houses where fish is a staple how do you eat fish every day mm. so they would specially buy fresh fish say in the month of may and then make pickles out of it in different batches mm. so that they could enjoy fish every day your your um, you know your um, bombay duck yeah. or your prawns you can still enjoy it every day with your dal and rice but and 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 because it stays longer than say your ordinary curries i said it was a perfect story to kind of you know mm. go back to Yeah. Because it it was a custom that was celebrated for a very long time. Now you can obviously store your f- you know fish in the fridge yeah. uh, in the in the refrigerator. So the idea of monsoon pickles don't exist anymore. Mm. Families don't know about it. Yeah. But there are some people still preserving the tradition. So I thought, why not talk about it before people forget yeah. that we did have monsoon pickles <laughs> and Bombay balcha. Yes, in a very weird <laughs> yes. sense, becomes yes. an entire story. Because I I'm. Absolutely in awe in how our conversation has also come into like a proper full circle. We started talking about the balcha, the food in the beginning, and just how the stories in the book have been marinated over time. Because mm-hmm. this is something that I want to tell you. Like whenever I read your work, be it even a features column or anything that you write, to be very honest, I feel like it has come from this very nice place of giving it a lot of thought. Mm. And since you've been sitting on this book for so long, I'm very sure that the thought was marinated yes. yeah. well enough, and just. It's not just a treat for your eyes when you read it. It's also very like you can actually feel a lot of other senses working. Like you can smell the food, you can see how those gullies and nooks and crannies turn Thank around, you. and it's just it's just one hell of an experience. Like you just are sitting at home, but you're actually in the streets. You're actually walking. Michael is leading you somewhere, and you're like, right. I don't know what's going to come up on the next page. and sometimes you end up in the unfamiliar to begin with and then you realize okay it's like it's like figuring out a new building that you just moved in and right. you have all of this this insecurity of meeting your new neighbors and seeing how the community is going to be and you're just going door to door trying to make friends with people and then you see these weird like tricks and trades of how people live their lives and at the backdrop of a larger story and that's a very difficult feat to achieve thank i have you. to congratulate you on thank that thank you so much and after this very short break i believe you're going to read us a few lines sure. from your book yes, and I that's going to be fun thank, thank you thank you hi guys this is ayushi and i am ritasha and welcome to agla station adulthood it's a fun podcast we've got going on and we'd love for you to tune in and enjoy with us Join us as we stop at various stations and discuss different topics that seem to be bothering us and hope to do as well. Relationships, beauty, just being an adult, lots of different things. We don't have a great grip on it, but we've done okay so far. Catch Agla Station Adulthood every Thursday on the IVM app, the IVM website, or wherever else you get your podcasts. The wedding at Kavel, November 1953. 
The bell at the church of Our Lady of Hope swung slowly, ringing a sound so beautiful that those who heard it wouldn't forget it for eons. It had music, it had rhythm, and it had strength. It had everything a church bell could boast of. Such was the sway of the enormous clapper that when it struck the rim of its brass container, its thud pervaded through all of Cavell in a divine ceremonious hum. A recent addition to the 235-year-old church after the last bell had died a painful death when it accidentally fell off the frame and was crushed beyond recognition, this instrument played for the first time at Michael Cutino and Merlin Mascarenes's wedding. The new bell was a restored 18th-century wartime relic from the Battle of Bassine, now Wasai, a suburban town near se- nearly 70 kilometers from Bombay. In the 1730s, when the Marathas decided to wage war against the Portuguese who helmed the scene, they first started by conquering their territories and forts in the vicinity. By the time the Portuguese surrendered in the scene, the Marathas had already destroyed 80 churches, including those in Chol, Daman and Dio, and Reb Danda. The bell now sitting in Kavel had been given as a gift to one of the Maratha army officials as a victory symbol from the war. After ringing at a temple in Raigad for over two and a half centuries, a sarpanch of the village noticed the crucifix embossed on it and decided to return it to the church. It travelled over 85 kilometres to the Archdiocese of Bombay, where it was repaired and refurbished to its former glory. After deliberations, the priest decided that the church at Cavell could be the rightful recipient of this ancient instrument because its own history was so closely enmeshed with the Portuguese feudal lord who once owned the chapel. That said, nobody had been able as yet to accurately confirm the ancestry of the bell. Its history was all conjecture. We have a surprise for you, Father Augustin Fernandes, the priest officiating at the wedding, said to the newly married couple after they had taken their vows. Michael and Merlin were in the midst of unriddling the priest's cryptic declaration when the bell suddenly chimed. The groom broke into a happy smile. The bride blushed. The congregation listened with rapt attention. On Dr. Dilemma Street, passers-by stopped in their places to listen to it. In Cavell and the many churches nearby, it was a time-honoured tradition to ring the bell daily at dawn. If the bell rang at any other time, it was either to announce the death of a parishioner or to make known that the sacrament of matrimony had just been bestowed upon a couple. Today it rang only for happy reasons. The sweet-sounding bell worked its magic on Merlin in particular. Still far from polishing her apologetic English, Merlin was aware that the elite Cavellites would try and make conversation with her today. Her fear was that she would give herself away and that she'd be mocked for landing such a good catch, a writer husband who spoke impeccable English. She was aware that even if her in-laws, especially her mum-in-law, Karen, joked about how she was an embarrassment to the Goans. While Michael had been encouraging, it was only the harmonious music from the bell that calmed her anxious nerves. On that wintry day of 15 November 1953, when the wedding party was still reeling from the after-effects of that resounding church bell, the Goan Catholic Club at Pius House, where the reception was to take place, was also swept off its foundation by the sound. With a guest list of over 500 people, boundless food and wine, and a live band to keep all and sundry occupied, the wedding was expected to be the grandest cavell and its neighbouring Catholic hamlets had ever witnessed. The icing on the cake was the arrival of a heavyweight guest, who was a subject of discussion even before wedding invitations were sent out. Anxious mothers and loveless daughters had never waited so eagerly to receive an invitation to the reception as they did now. Also, they could feast their eyes on Merlin's hockey player cousin, Lester Fernandez. He was the son of her stepmom, Colleen Ferreira's elder sister. A wink shy of making it to the Indian national hockey team, Lester, whose distinguished and charming good looks were much talked about from Kulaba to Kaf Parade, had reluctantly agreed to grace his cousin's celebration at the club. He was too proud a man to be seen among the ordinary. 
but the Ferreras loved to show off the men of their family. They declared that Lester would raise the toast at the wedding. That way, the Cutinos were assured that the sports hero would be present at the function, even for a while. It was also common knowledge that the family was desperately looking for a wife for the 29-year-old sports hero. Lester, people said, had not once looked at a girl with the roving eye of a man hungry for female attention. Which parent would dare forego a chance to marry their daughter to a man of such fine distinction? Families invited to the reception saw to it that their daughters were dressed as gorgeously as the bride. When the mass came to an end, you could see the pretty lasses head for the reception at Pius House. Marlene de Silva was dressed like a canary. The yellow of her dress and the white of her shoes accessorized with glistening pearl jewellery and imbued with the richness of the steely grey sea made her the brightest prospect among the gold diggers' club. Thelma de Costa was a close second. She, she was a piano virtuoso whose gifted fingers were as much the talk of the town as Lester's hockey stick. She had turned into a fine beauty. But it was her teal blue knee-length cotton skirt teamed with an off-white silk blouse that was the distraction today. Her only drawback was her pallid face that despite bringing the features of a beautiful young lady lacked the grace to warm a man's heart. Even if she smiled, you could never tell. Even if she cried, you would never know. That was how plastic her face was, unmoved and non-malleable to the swings and slights of human emotions. I really, really regret you keeping that book down because I really want to know what happened. And to know more, we should all go to Amazon. Is the book available on Amazon? Right, yes, Basically. it is. So yes, it's Bombay Balchao. And you should go get it and know what happens to Lester and a lot of the other amazing characters in the tale. And this has been such a fun conversation, Jane. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. you so much, Lakshmi. Where can we find you on the internet? Because, yeah. I am you. on Instagram. Okay. So that's Jane Borges 87. That's okay. my Instagram handle. And yes, I think, and Twitter, Jane Borges 9. That's where you can find me. Perfect. That sounds good. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And Thank you so much for having me here. Really kind to send us five copies of your book. Yes. Which are going to be up for a giveaway. So to know more as to what happens, how we making the giveaway come about, stay tuned and you will hear about it really, really soon on our Instagram. So keep an eye on Jane's Instagram and at IBM Podcasts and you'll know more. Thank you so much for being here, Jane. Thank Please you again. Thank, Thank you. you. In the internet it's a meme no it's a cat video no it's the geek fruit podcast that's right we interrupt this riveting broadcast to tell you about our show the geek fruit podcast where tejas dinkar and i jishnu talk about everything in pop culture including dc marvel star wars netflix and everything in between you know how your friends hate it when you ramble about some nerdy crap and you just want somebody to listen to you well sorry there's nothing we can do about that but come listen to us ramble and it'll almost be like the real thing kind of Listen to new episodes of the Geek Fruit Podcast every Monday and the Geek Fruit Bulletin every Thursday on iTunes, Google Podcasts, the IVM app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Happy listening, you nerds.